Hello, it's Scott Manley here. While I was in New Jersey, I had to go and visit one of the most important scientific uh, instruments of all time involved in not one but two world-changing experiments. This is the Holmdel Horn Antenna at Bell Labs, and it was used as part of Project ECHO to be, uh, well, part of the world's first communication satellite test. And later, it was repurposed by a pair of astronomers who found the echoes of the Big Bang. So yeah, this is a place called Crawford Hill. It's in a little place called Holmdel in New Jersey. On the way there, I passed the John Bon Jovi Highway Service Station. And you know, for a long time, that's what New Jersey meant to me as a kid in Scotland. So the town has a few large facilities which were established by Bell Labs. And there's a bunch of important research that actually happened there. Carl Jansky built his very first radio telescope here and discovered radio emissions from the galactic core in 1933. The town's water tower is designed as a monument to the invention of the transistor, although technically the transistor was actually invented at the Murray Hill Labs about half an hour to the north. Uh, the same labs also, by the way, that birthed Unix. However, this antenna was built originally for Project ECHO, an early plan to demonstrate the potential of satellite communications. The antenna uses a reflector horn design, also known as a hog antenna, because it was designed and built by David Hogg, although he didn't come up with the concept. That is credited to Albert Beck and Halbert, uh, Har Harold Fries in 1941. So yeah, a regular horn antenna is where the end of a waveguide, that is a fancy pipe that carries radio waves, is flared outwards into a horn shape. And the slow change in the cross section of the waveguide creates a smoothly changing impedance. And so without this smooth change in the conditions, you'll actually get a, a lot of signal reflection where there's like a big jump or change or discontinuity in the impedance. And so that basically reflects signals going in, and signals going out. So they use these horn uh, antenna in transmitters and receivers. If you look at like a big parabolic dish receiver, you'll find a horn antenna at the focal point. So anyway, at the end of the horn, there's a parabolic reflector mounted at 45 degrees. So in effect, the whole thing is a parabolic dish, but it is reflecting to a point that's like far off axis. The big advantage this design offered was that the sides of the horn act as shielding to block radio sources from the side, stopping any noise from ground sources from leaking in, which made it exceptionally good for receiving signals from the sky. The structure is about 15 metres long and sits on a 10 metre turntable with the receiving equipment inside a hut that's mounted to the turntable and it rotates as the telescope or the antenna rotates around the azimuth. The aperture is about 36 square metres and the gain is about 43 decibels and it has a beam width of about 1.5 degrees. So Project ECHO was NASA's first attempt at a communication satellite. It was a large, inflatable, metallized balloon which would be able to reflect radio signals. The US had been launching balloons for a long time. The idea originally arose in the early days of space research when they were looking for payloads to fly on the recently acquired A4 rocket, also known as the V2. A balloon would serve as an excellent way to determine atmospheric drag and therefore atmospheric density. There were many flights of balloons. Some of them were just suborbital flights to test the inflation technology. In one case, the suborbital flight happened just after sunset and the balloon inflation was sufficiently violent to shred the balloon and create a cascade of uh, fragments, which created quite a, a striking show, so much that uh, basically people in the eastern coast were reporting UFOs. But Project ECHO was the biggest of the balloons. It was about 30 meters or 100 feet in diameter. It would be the largest object in space at the time, but very low mass. It was made of a thin skin of metallized polymers, or what is known as mylar. The primary manufacturer was General Mills, who you might know as a maker of cereals in the US. During World War II, they used their expertise with polythene bags to start making weather balloons for the war effort. And after the war, they continued. There's a fun story about their work with the CIA, which led to an unintended collaboration with the Soviet space program. And you can watch my video on this over there. 
So the ECHO satellite was launched from Vandenberg on 12th of August in 1960 by a Thor Delta. It was launched into a 1600 kilometer orbit or 1000 miles because unlike other satellites, the passive balloon didn't actually care about the radiation in the Van Allen belts. And hours later, like on the first orbital pass, they successfully signaled or transmitted or relayed a signal from Goldstone in California, bounced off the satellite and received it at this antenna in New Jersey. They were extraordinarily lucky to get this on the first attempt. They didn't have proper orbital elements to track the satellite at this point. They just used pre-launch predictions. If the launch hadn't been especially accurate, then this demonstration would have taken a bit longer. But yes, yeah, subsequently, there would be many more demonstrations with this specific satellite showing that the relays were indeed possible. But by the time ECHO had launched, NASA had already decided that passive reflectors were a dead end for communication. And they were working with industry on active relay satellites. Active satellites massively reduce the requirements on the ground-based har hardware at the expense of more complicated satellites. But when you've got one satellite and lots of ground hardware, it makes much more sense. And so at some point, the communications experiments wind down. Some astronomers named Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson take over the antenna with the plan to map out radio emissions across the Milky Way. And being good scientists, of course, they needed to understand the instrument noise so that they could separate out the legitimate signal from the noise. And they tweak the equipment to try to maximize the sensitivity, but there's this hiss at the microwave end of the spectrum, around four gigahertz, that they just can't eliminate no matter what they do. I mean, they try everything, right? They've got you know, cooled electronics, uh, they're using metal tape on the inside to eliminate seams in the construction. Um, they're even cleaning the horn of bird poop because they thought that the poop's dielectric qualities might result in noise being generated uh, or shifted into this wave band. The noise, however, remained and it showed up no matter where they pointed the antenna in the sky, even when there was nothing else visible. And at the same time, Robert Dick, Jim Peebles and David Wilkinson at Princeton University, just 60 kilometers, you know, 37 miles away, they were preparing to search for this exact kind of radio noise. Dick and his colleagues reasoned that the Big Bang likely emitted a great deal of radiation and with the proper instrumentation, this radiation should be detectable. But Doppler shifted from, you know, visible wavelengths down into microwaves. So they had written a paper predicting this exact phenomenon. But before publication, Penzias and Wilson were alerted to this preprint. And after discussing that, they talked to the team, invited them over, and the two teams decided to publish separate papers, one on the theory and one on the actual observation. So this observation was amazingly good evidence for the Big Bang, which Basically, this observation has only got better as we've looked more and more at the cosmic microwave background. It started out as a single data point at 4.08 gigahertz, but modern measurements show it as a perfect black body curve with a temperature of 2.75 Kelvin. We have detailed maps of this across the sky with subtle variation and curiously uh, correlations that exist beyond their cosmic horizon, which in turn implies inflation. The cosmic microwave background has also eliminated other theories, right? False steps in scientific models that just can't work now that we know the, this Big Bang uh, cosmic radiation exists. Steady state models, they're not viable anymore. I mean, it doesn't mean that they're completely eliminated. Like Fred Hoyle looked at it and he had the idea, well, maybe we could have a steady state universe if there's lots of really tiny needles floating around in space. Hans Alfen had an alternate idea of plasma cosmology where electrical electromagnetic activity would drive the structure building of the universe. And he ultimately abandoned that and partly because it predicted that they would see synchrotron radiation, which has a completely different spectrum from black body radiation. And you know, whenever I talk about you know Big Bang and cosmic microwave background, there's always a few comments from people pointing me to a guy um, 
who insist that no, actually the cosmic microwave background is actually just telescopes seeing the reflection of the ocean. Even when the telescope is the Planck telescope sitting a million miles from Earth and pointed away from it. Yeah, I mean, there's people that seriously believe this charlatan. Anyway, look, over a decade after the simple discovery that Penzias and Wilson made, they would be awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics. It was in 1978. By then, of course, they'd moved on to other research, and some of the research was actually carried out on this other antenna that's on top of the hill. And I don't honestly know a lot about Penzias and Wilson's work since then, but I do know that this antenna in the early 2000s actually hosted another experiment studying the co cosmic microwave background radiation. It was called CAPMAP. And what they tried to do was map or measure polarization near the celestial pole. So yeah, this you know, research continued going on at this site well into the 21st century, but now it's abandoned. There's nobody working on the building at the bottom of the hill. The buildings at the top are all falling apart. Some have been damaged by vandalism, which is Really a shame because this town clearly has some amazing science and space history associated with it. The building and land was sold about a year ago and I don't know what the plans might be for it, but I do hope that some effort goes into preserving this site for historic uh, reasons. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.